Robinson Crusoe, often called the first English novel, was written by Daniel Defoe and published in 1719. The novel is the tale of one man's survival on a desert island following a shipwreck. Published in 1719, the book didn't carry Defoe's name, and it was offered to the public as a true account of real events, documented by a real man named Crusoe. But readers were immediately skeptical. The novel, famously, is about how the title character, Robinson Crusoe, becomes marooned on an island off the northeast coast of South America. As a young man, Crusoe had gone to sea in the hope of making his fortune. Crusoe is on a ship bound for Africa, where he plans to buy slaves for his plantations in South America, when the ship is wrecked on an island and Crusoe is the only survivor. Alone on a desert island, Crusoe manages to survive thanks to his pluck and pragmatism. He keeps himself sane by keeping a diary, manages to build himself a shelter, and finds a way of salvaging useful goods from the wrecked ship, including guns. Twelve years pass in this way, until one momentous day, Crusoe finds a single human footprint in the sand. But he has to wait another ten years before he discovers the key to the mystery. Natives from the nearby islands, who practices cannibalism, have visited the island, and when they next return, Crusoe attacks them, using his musket salvaged from the shipwreck all those years ago. He takes one of the natives captive and names him Man Friday, because, according to Crusoe's, probably inaccurate, calendar, that's the day of the week on which they first meet. Crusoe teaches Man Friday English and converts him to Christianity. When Crusoe learns that Man Friday's fellow natives are keeping white prisoners on their neighboring island, he vows to rescue them. Together, the two of them build a boat. When more natives attack the island with captives, Crusoe and Friday rescue the captives and kill the natives. The two captives they've freed are none other than Friday's own father and a Spanish man. Crusoe sends them both off to the other island in the newly made boat, telling them to free the other prisoners. Meanwhile, a ship arrives at the island. A mutiny has taken place on board, and the crew throw the captain and his loyal supporters onto the island. Before the ship can leave, Crusoe has teamed up with the captain and his men, and between them they retake the ship from the mutineers, who settle on the island while Crusoe takes the ship home to England. Robinson Crusoe has been away from England for many years by this stage, he was marooned on his island for over twenty years and his parents have died. But he has become wealthy, thanks to his plantations in Brazil, so he gets married and settles down. His wife dies a few years later, and Crusoe, along with Friday, once again leaves home. At the center of Robinson Crusoe is a tension between society and individuality. As the novel begins, Robinson breaks free of his family and the middle-class society in which they live in order to pursue his own life. If he were to stay at home, he would live a life already arranged for him by his father and by the constraints of English society. By setting out to sea, Robinson prioritizes his sense of individuality over his family and society at large. Robinson gets exactly what he asks for, and more than he bargained for, when he finds himself stranded alone on his island. There, he lives entirely as an individual apart from society and is forced to struggle against nature to survive. He becomes self-sufficient and learns how to make and do things himself, discovering ingenuity he didn't know he had. Thus, one could say that being separated from society leads to Robinson becoming a better person. Robinson himself seems to come to this conclusion as he realizes that his experience brings him closer to God and that living alone on the island allows for a life largely without sin, he makes, harvests, and hunts only what he needs, so there is nothing for him to be covetous of or greedy for. And while he is alone, he does not suffer from lust or pride. Robinson comes around to liking his individual existence on the island so much that, at times in the novel, it is unclear whether he even wants to be rescued and returned to society. And when he finally does return to England, he notes how much worry and stress issues of money and property caused him. Nonetheless, there are some problems with Robinson's valuing of individuality over society. For one, while Robinson values his own personal liberty, he doesn't respect that of others. He hates being a slave, 
but is quick to sell Zuri into the service of the Portuguese captain. Similarly, he treats Friday as his inferior servant. This maltreatment of others can be related as well to Robinson's narcissistic style of narration. His narrative is always about himself, to the degree that he hardly even gives the names of other characters. We never learn the name of his wife, for example, whose death Robinson describes quickly and unemotionally at the end of the novel before hastening to tell us more of his own adventures. And finally, Robinson's intense individualism is inseparable from his painful isolation. He feels lonely in Brazil, and then is literally isolated, the word comes from the Latin word for island, insula, when he is stranded on his island all alone. His only companions are his animals and, while he learns to enjoy life on the island, he still feels a deep desire for the human companionship that he lacks. Thus, the novel values individuality, but also shows the dangers of narcissism and isolation that may come with it. While Defoe presents individuality as important, Robinson does decide to leave his island in the end. And, as we learn when he returns, he turns his haven of individualism into a society, a thriving colony with a substantial population. Society may curb an individual's independence, but it also provides valuable companionship. While Robinson rejects the claims of society in favor of individuality in the beginning of the novel, he ultimately comes around to trying to balance the two. Civilization, for Crusoe, is his connection to his old life as he lives on the island, surrounded by nature. Nature and civilization are contrasts, albeit not contradictory. Crusoe has grown up in a civilization and believes this system of rules to be superior to the nature and supposed wilderness the natives, or savages as he calls them, are living in. Only when he learns there are specific rules behind cannibalism, that it is part of the natives' religion and tradition, does he somewhat accept the concept. Crusoe is clinging on to civilization as he lives on the island, still wearing clothes, building himself houses and domesticating animals. He even takes the money he finds on the shipwrecks, even though he clearly has no use of it. Nature is ambivalent in the novel, causing the storms and earthquakes, destroying the ships and putting the wild animals in Crusoe's way. Nature also provides him with the fruits, fields and animals he needs to survive on the island, gives Crusoe a calm sea to get the supplies from the ships and allows his seeds to grow. Crusoe learns to be grateful for nature and, in a way, even lets it replace civilization. For example, instead of having a human companion, he has Pole, the parrot, whom he talks to as if he was a civilized human being. Nature, in Crusoe's eyes, is God's work. The story of Robinson Crusoe was intended by Defoe to be a moral example for readers on how to live godly lives. The importance of repenting one's sins is the primary religious issue Crusoe faces in the novel. When he sets out, Crusoe defies both his father's and what he believes are God's wishes for his life, likening his eventual isolation on the island to Adam and Eve's being cast out of the Garden of Eden. For Crusoe to prosper on the island, an angel in a dream tells him he must repent and throw himself at the mercy of God. Only after he repents does he begin to perceive the challenge of mastering nature and taming the island in a positive light. Crusoe's repentance marks the key point of his transition from self-pitying victim to determined master of his environment. Robinson Crusoe contains profound messages for us today. It is an enactment of the modern, secular individual making his way alone in the world and overcoming challenges through the power of his own unaided reason.